What is popular today can be forgotten tomorrow. Unless our memories are constantly reminded, even the most popular of books, movies, TV shows, or even political causes can fade away into distant memories. The most popular books of any given year are all the talk and rage when they are fresh on the market. But how much people talk about bestsellers after a year? How about after 10 years? And how about after 100 years? Today I'll be talking about someone who, despite his monumental popularity in his own days, has been all but forgotten except for a few niche readers and economists. I'm talking about, of course, the 19th century self-made economist and free trade crusader, Henry George, one of the world's most articulate and powerful advocates of the power of free trade and a simplified system of taxation. During his lifetime, he became an economic superstar, touring the US and Europe, advising people on how to secure a broadly prosperous future, one in which poverty and deprivation would hopefully become distant memories of the past. On September 2nd, 1839, Henry George was born in Philadelphia to a family of English and Scottish heritage. He was the second of ten children in a roughly middle-class family. Not too poor enough to be deprived, but not wealthy enough to avoid toil and labour. George's father, Richard, was a publisher of Episcopalian religious texts. Though not a particularly successful publisher, George's father impressively managed to support a large family through his work. Though George considered himself a religious man throughout his life, he never really fit neatly into any particular denomination within Catholicism or Protestantism. Regardless though, George's early life was shaped by his family's pious attitudes and habits. As a boy, George was constantly exposed to the language and style of the King James Bible, a resource he would draw upon for the rest of his life. George's father sent to an Episcopal Academy in Philadelphia for his education, an institution George did not enjoy or appreciate. Eventually, George convinced his father to hire a tutor instead, while he independently supplemented his education through reading extensively and attending lectures. Despite being a precocious young mind, George's formal education ended when he was only 14 years old. He immediately began work as a clerk for an importing house out of economic necessity. In 1855, at the age of 15, George found work as a foremast boy on a ship sailing to Melbourne and Calcutta. Afterwards, he returned to Philadelphia, learning the ropes of typesetting. But during the economic depression of 1857, George returned to the sea once again, bound for the Pacific coast. But George left the ship when he hit San Francisco. He traveled to Canada to take part in the gold rush, but like many others, he was already too late. Today we are accustomed to the idea of childhood and our teenage years being a time of innocence and exploration. But for most of human history, childhood did not have a rosy or positive connotation. The vast majority of children had to work just like their parents or they would starve. In George's lifetime, there was a great deal of economic growth and progress, but also alongside unprecedented levels of urban poverty. Potential intellectuals and innovators like Henry George received what little education they could until their studies were cut short by economic necessities. Despite his youth and a meager amount of schooling, George's papers from his time at sea show a budding intellect of a curious young man writing about politics, religion, thrift, and poetry. But education comes in many forms, one form being personal experience. Working as a clerk at an importing house and a crewman on a ship from a young age, George observed and appreciated the benefits of trade and cooperation. It is no surprise that the popular and effective advocates of free trade, such as Henry George or Frederick Bastiat, grew up in a mercurial environment. George's commitment to free trade was not a dry, abstract theory, but a belief he held due to personal experience and moral conviction. At the age of 19, in 1858, George emigrated to California a decade after the gold rush. With few opportunities for employment, George helped his cousin open a store for gold miners. Eventually, George and his cousin had an argument, causing George to leave his employment. Contemplating for just a moment working in the grueling mines, George thankfully decided to find work as a typesetter instead. However, this job was short-lived. George quickly found work again as a rice weigher in a warehouse. With little money and few friends in a new home, George spent his spare hours studying economics. When the warehouse closed, George was unemployed again. But he landed another typesetting job, which again, quickly evaporated. Unemployment was a massive issue in these days. Though this was undoubtedly a very tough period in George's life, it was in California at the age of 19 that he met the love of his life, Annie Christina Fox, a 17-year-old girl originally from Australia. Annie was orphaned and was under the care of her uncle, who, upon meeting Henry George, quickly rejected him as a candidate for marriage due to his impoverishment. Ignoring her uncle, George borrowed a suit and married Anna without a penny to his name. 
Though madly in love, the first years of their marriage coincided with the Civil War and a miserable job market. The couple moved to Sacramento where George could set type, but the firm George worked for collapsed. Upon returning to San Francisco, he realized the job market was dire. When George and Anna had their second child, George was reduced to begging to feed his family. He recounted that he spotted a man one day and decided if he didn't hand him any money, he would attempt to mug him to feed his family. Thankfully, the stranger simply obliged when George asked for money. Reflecting on this event, George admits that he contemplated killing the man to help his family. After hitting rock bottom, George finally found a steady printing job for the San Francisco Times. Doubling down on his studies to make up for his lack of formal education, George began to write articles in the policy debates of the day. Though it is hard to pin down for certain what George was reading at the time, later in life we confirm that he had read Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and Herbert Spencer, all important liberal thinkers. By 1867, George secured a position as a managing editor. He began to work for multiple newspapers and even started his own newspaper called the San Francisco Daily Evening Post, which he managed as an editor for four years until 1875, when credit issues forced George to abandon the newspaper. Yet again, George was on the streets begging, but thankfully this time he had no murderous machinations. Thanks to the newspaper industry, George found a steady source of income for his family. With his newfound comfort, he began to ponder getting involved in politics. Influenced by his family, George had begun his political life as an ardent admirer of Lincoln and a Republican, and a protectionist. Though still an admirer of Lincoln by manhood, George became a Democrat, what was then the party of free trade and low taxes. Oh, how things change. Throughout his early writings, George made a name for himself as a critic of land speculators, corrupt officials, and railroad interests. He ran for office as a member of the state assembly, but executives from the Central Pacific Railroad Company intervened and cost George his bid for his seat. However, George was not discouraged. In 1876, he was appointed state inspector of gas meters, a job he took very seriously, working tirelessly to improve the safety standards of California's infrastructure, much to the chagrin of gas-related business interests. For the first time in his life, George experienced a degree of economic stability and steady employment. In 1877, while looking over San Francisco Bay, George reports he had an epiphany that explained why such prosperity and such poverty could coexist together. While riding his horse, George stopped and conversed with the cattle driver, asking him how much the land was worth. The man replied that he didn't really know what the land was worth, but you could buy an acre for $1,000 a pop from some guy over the hill. George explains that like a flash it came to him. In his words, with the growth of population, land grows in value, and the men who work it must pay more for the privilege. A potential article for a magazine eventually grew, thanks to the encouragement of friends, into Progress and Poverty, Henry George's magnum opus. In his book, Progress and Poverty, George aimed to identify how in an era of unprecedented prosperity, there was also unprecedented poverty. George argues that wealth from recent progress is concentrated in a small class of people who boast massive personal fortunes, leading to massively unequal distributions of wealth too. Thus, progress and poverty strangely coexist. While visiting New York, George was shocked to see how many people were living in poverty in a well-established city compared to the new frontiers of California. George discusses some possible solutions to poverty, including reducing the national debt, educating workers, unionizing efforts, and even socialist means such as redistributing the land or government intervention in the economy. But George rejects all of these answers, as he says none of them attack the real cause of poverty. Henry George has a similar philosophy to John Locke. He argues that the natural right of ownership is derived ultimately from the producer of said goods. He explains that our right to the fruits of our labor come from our natural right to man to own himself. But this means a distinction needs to be made. For George, humans can only rightfully hold something as their own if it is a source of human labor. For George, a real and natural distinction exists between the results of labor and the gratuitous offerings of nature. According to George, there is no moral basis for private property in land. The current distribution of land is not based on any principle of justice or natural law, but instead buttressed by the artificial laws of men. So if a man is rightfully entitled to the produce of his labor, then no one can be rightfully entitled to the ownership of anything which is not the produce of labor, or the labor of someone else whom from the right was passed to him. Now, I know what you might be thinking, how can this guy be a liberal if he's against private property of all things? But George is no socialist or communist by any means. He promptly rejects the idea of distributing land equally, explaining that an equal distribution of land is impossible. Anything short of that would only be a mitigation, not a cure. A mitigation that would prevent the adoption of a cure. 
Instead, George argues that land ownership is not the target in his sites, but instead what he argues are the unjust earnings of landowners, rent. So why exactly does George believe rent is unearned? By George's standards, we have a moral right to hold on to what is produced by our individual labour. So imagine a newly emerging city, a wealthy tycoon begins buying up apartment blocks. Being a freshly founded city, the apartment blocks have only a few amenities or options for transport at the beginning. But over time, roads are paved, infrastructure is built, and businesses open up near the apartments. The value of this tycoon's apartments have increased thanks to their central location and bustling environment. But the tycoon himself did not produce any of the wonderful things that make this building worth living in. Henry George argued that a huge amount of wealth generated by technology in the free market is actually possessed by monopolists and landowners, who through economic rents become wealthier. While landowners and monopolists may have thrived, everyday workers experienced increasingly burdensome taxes. As all of this is happening, natural resources are monopolized and restricted, leading to what he called a form of wage slavery, where the average worker has no choice but to take whatever work they can find, as he had done for a lot of his life. But Henry George posed a unique solution to this problem, one that is not wholly socialist nor wholly capitalist, yet appealing to both sides. Landowners can hold onto their property and hold on any improvements they make to their property. That's perfectly fine. No mass expropriation is necessary. However, Henry George says, landowners pay what is now dubbed a land value tax. The state would tax the rent or accrued gains of land. Now, libertarians might be cringing, but here, there's a catch. Henry George also argues that the land value tax should be the only tax. In the compromise from private ownership to private possession, George recommends the removal of all taxes upon labour or any that distort market prices. That means in the Georgist utopia there are no tariffs, there is no sales tax, there is no income tax. All this is replaced by the land value tax, a tax that specifically targets the well-to-do. He explains that, We may leave them safely in the shell if we take the kernel. It is not necessary to confiscate the land, it is only necessary to confiscate the rent. Of all people, the libertarian economist and Nobel laureate Milton Friedman said, all the methods of taxation in his opinion, the least bad was Henry George's land tax. Some classical liberals and libertarians might be uneasy with Henry George and decry him as a sort of pseudo-socialist, but George's contemporary, Karl Marx, loathed the land value tax and described it as merely an attempt tricked out with socialism to save the capitalist regime and indeed to re-establish it on an even broader basis than at present. And Marx is correct, Henry George was no enemy of capitalism or free markets. Unlike socialists, George saw no contradiction or tension between labour and capital. In his own words, he observed that socialism fails to see that oppression does not come from nature of capital, but from the wrong that robs labour of capital by divorcing it from the land, and that creates a fictitious capital that is really capitalised monopoly. Furthermore, he argues, it would be impossible for capital to oppress labour were labour free to the natural material of production. George was an advocate of markets and wanted to see any tax upon labour or income abolished. While some might refer to Georgism as a kind of third way between capitalism and socialism, Henry George undoubtedly saw the free market as an engine for prosperity. Later in life, Henry George would write, We see no evil in competition, but deem unrestricted competition to be necessary to the health of the industrial and social organism, as the free circulation of blood is to the health of the bodily organism. While some might be uneasy with George's system of taxation, it is undeniable that he is a friend of markets the institution that forms the linchpin of classical liberal thought. After spending a year and a half writing Progress from Poverty, it was finally published in New York in 1880. Though stale started slow, they rapidly grew alongside George's reputation. Progress from Poverty eventually sold 3 million copies. It is still to this day one of the best-selling economics books of all time. And for the time, it was a pretty unheard of achievement for a dry, abstract book in economics to have such a wide readership. The only book that sold more copies than Progress and Poverty in the US during the 1890s was the Bible. So with all this newfound popularity, George embarked on a tour to Europe within the year, preaching a solution to poverty. Despite his English heritage, George actually received his most enthusiastic welcome from Ireland and Scotland, two nations that were under the thumb of the British Empire, with a lot of the population working land rented to them by a select few powerful landlords. After a year in Europe, George returned to America, and he began touring the country, giving lectures on his book and distributing cheap copies that sold at an uncanny speed. Movements across the US and Europe sprung up demanding land reform, using the arguments of progress and poverty. In 1886, George even ran for the mayor of New York City against Abraham Hewitt, 
a beneficiary of the Democrat-controlled political machine at the time. Fearing George's popularity, Democrat members offered him a congressional seat if he would simply drop out of the election, but George declined, saying that he wanted to raise hell. And though George lost the election, possibly due to foul play, either way it was an extremely impressive showing, with him beating the Republican candidate and future president Theodore Roosevelt. George yet again ran for office in 1887 in New York's election for Secretary of State, but came in a distant third. Roughly during the same period of political activity, George wrote his book, Protection or Free Trade. Following the depression of 1873 to 1878, the issue of tariffs took the national stage yet again. After the blinding success of progress and poverty, George is ready to spread awareness of the destructive nature of tariffs. In Protection or Free Trade, George argues that the real-world effects of tariffs is to lessen aggregate wealth and to foster monopolies at the expense of the masses of people. He explained that tariffs can never make a nation wealthier. If the US was at war with another nation, the Navy might blockade around the country they're at war with, or the legislature might pass sanctions of the opposing nation. But George believed that tariffs were really no different from this military action. He explained that what protection teaches us is to do to ourselves in times of peace what enemies seek to do to us in times of war. George illustrated time and time again how most of the protected industries in the US were capital intensive, not labor intensive. This means that a few rich capitalists were increasing their wealth using poorly thought out laws and taxpayers' money. Despite all the rhetoric of protectionists, George explained that the real motive of protection is always the profit of employing the capitalist. The everyday worker does not feel the benefits of tariffs. Far, far in advance of his contemporaries, George saw how concentrated interest groups could hijack the machinery of the state to pass laws that are beneficial to a small minority but harmful to the general public. But George's argument for free trade went well beyond mere efficiency. He viewed the free market as a vehicle for moral and social change. He writes that trade has always been the extinguisher of war, the eradicator of prejudice, and the diffuser of knowledge. Because he thinks that thanks to trade and cooperation with others, prejudices are worn down, wits are sharpened, language enriched, habits and customs brought to the test in comparison with new ideas. A market unhampered by unnecessary restrictions or protectionist policies will allow for greater progress, materially, but also might make us better people on the way. After years of constant activity touring across the country, in 1890, George suffered his first stroke. Though substantially weakened, George was determined to make his mark on politics. In 1897, he campaigned against the mayor of New York City, knowing full well this campaign might be his last. Tragically, George suffered a second stroke four days before the election and passed away at the young age of 58. In the largest funeral for an economist ever, over 100,000 people came to observe his funeral procession. Newspapers, both domestic and abroad, were filled with obituaries dedicated to the great Henry George. There has never been since such a public outpouring over the death of an economist. But Henry George was a lot more than just an economist. I think he was a moral crusader for the rights of the poor. He unrelentingly dedicated the latter half of his life to alleviating poverty and removing tariffs, two goals very much in line with classical liberal aims. Though Henry George was an immensely popular figure in his time, his widespread appeal rapidly diminished, making him an often forgotten figure despite the tremendous influence he once wielded. But his admirers over the years have come from all sorts of political persuasions. Classical liberals like Milton Friedman, Arthur Laffer and Friedrich Hayek was praised his work, but also left-leaning voices like Leo Tolstoy, Helen Keller, Albert Einstein, George Bernard Shaw and Aldous Huxley have praised his work too. Politicians, philosophers, scientists and writers from a dizzying array of political persuasions have found something to appreciate in the writings of Henry George which are always fueled by a humanist ethic of improving the human condition on the earth. While at first the land value tax might sound like the antithesis of all libertarian values, viewed in conjunction with Henry George's pro-free market stance and commitment to abolishing all other taxes, a George's world of private possession over private ownership doesn't sound half bad to me. Henry George has the uncanny ability to unite people of all political persuasions, a rare and powerful talent. During the latter half of his life, it is no exaggeration to say that he was the foremost voice in the US pushing for free markets and free people. And that's why we should remember him. Thanks Mo for listening. Portraits of Liberty is produced by Landry Aries and written by me, Paul Meany. If you like the show, make sure to review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to see more content like this, check out the website libertarism.org.